Hi, and welcome to the first webinar of 2020. Today's webinar is Avoiding Common Pitfalls in Conjoint Analysis, and our presenter is Brian McEwen. Brian has been with Sati Software for more than 11 years, helping customers do conjoint analysis and other types of research. In his role, he's seen a lot of different ways that conjoint analysis projects have gone wrong, so today's webinar will help you learn from his observations over the years. Please use the chat and the Q&A functions uh, that come with uh, Zoom to ask questions. And uh, some of the questions we may interrupt his presentation and answer them. Others will uh, answer at the end of his prepared remarks. So Brian, take it away. Great, thanks Aaron. All right, so like Aaron mentioned, um, we thought we'd put together a webinar to try to appeal to a pretty broad audience and just kind of gather together some of our collective wisdom. Uh, this isn't just my material, this is in talking uh, with other people as well, just to come up with some general tips of things that we see kind of people fall into the same type of traps over the years. So we're gonna break up uh, this content into um, several different chunks kind of focusing on uh, the design of your survey, then we're going to talk about field work, then we're going to talk about modeling and analysis um, and things like that. So that's our roadmap for today. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about are design pitfalls, things to try to think about and, and make sure that you um, get a good head start on your project. So the thing I wanted to start off with first is this article. Um, this was shared with me many years ago uh, when I was just getting started at Sawtooth um, and it was uh, called Backwards Marketing Research and it's, it goes all the way back to the 1985 uh, Harvard Business Review by Alan Andreessen and um, it's a, just a really good kind of cautionary tale about diving into a project and thinking that once I get the answers from my survey uh, then I'll know what to do and so it's kind of a cautionary tale he quotes, uh, kind of summarizes uh, the feelings of different people he talks about in the article by saying, you know, a lot of people have this plan. I know there's some things I don't know, and when the results come in, then I'll know more. And when I know more, then I can figure out what to do. Um, and then uh, going in with that kind of mindset, uh, a lot of people then kind of have a bit of a letdown and uh, say things like, the research mostly told me things I already knew. So a lot of people, you know, you already have a, an idea of brand preferences and willingness to pay of customers, um, segments, the demographics of your customers, those type of things. Um, so uh, not that you can't learn anything this way, but it's probably not the best way to think about that. Once you see the research, then you'll know the right questions to ask. But thinking a bit more strategically about what type of questions it is that you're trying to answer. So the general theme is to begin with the end in mind. And this is really applicable for conjoint projects. Um, and I'm gonna kind of narrow in and say, think about what type of simulations you're gonna want to run. Um, for those who are familiar with conjoint, you know you're gonna get things like uh, attribute importance scores and utility scores that help us understand the relative desirability um, of the things that we test. Um, and that's going to be great. That's going to help you understand what's driving people and kind of what's making them tick. Um, but it's better to try to think in terms of strategic questions. What type of specific questions am I trying uh, to answer? So a lot of people, you know, we get going, uh, they, they decide on a conjoint project, they choose what attributes and levels, and they kind of have very general statements like, we want to figure out what features are important to our customers and what they're willing to pay for them. And that's not bad per se, um, but again, I would challenge you to try to uh, think a bit more strategically. So instead of, we'll cross that one out and say, instead of doing something like that, uh, we'll try to be a little more specific. For example, we wanna figure out what features are important to our customers. So we're including these three features. They're gonna be binary, which means they just turn on and off. Um, that means they're going to they're going to vary independently and we're going to come up with a measurement of kind of the independent effect of turning those features on and off that's going to give us a really good read to figure out how much they drive demand or something like we want to investigate willingness to pay 
So we've decided to test plus or minus 20% on our price attribute, and we're going to allow features to show up which, with each brand so that we're not correlating features with prices and things like that. Um, the goal is to understand the trade-offs that people are willing to make. So these aren't perfect, these aren't exactly what you're gonna wanna do, but just a, a nudge in the right direction to think, uh, try to be a little more specific, try to be a little more strategic and, and really um, state clearly so that everyone's on board about what the goals are of the conjoint. What type of things do you want, to, what type of questions do you wanna answer once you're done? That's gonna help you think about what type of simulations you're gonna run which just keeps flowing back uh, into what attributes and levels and uh, other design um, implementations that you decide on. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we, we end up kind of pushing back on a lot is that a lot of people approach conjoint analysis um, as product testing, where they think, I, you know, I've got products A, B, and C that are on the store shelves. Um, and yeah, I can definitely break those down into attributes and levels, but then they start putting in lots of prohibitions or they wanna make the pricing really complicated, which in itself is a good goal. You wanna make your survey realistic, but it often comes at the expense of the quality of the model that you're building. Um, and I'll show you some examples a little later, but you have to remember that the goal of a conjoint analysis is to build a generalized model of preference. Our whole whole exercise, the whole goal of the exercise is to systematically vary uh, the features of a product, turning things on and off, uh, increasing and decreasing the price, and observing how people's preferences change, either through answering on a rating scale or making choices. We want to try to quantify, we want to put numbers to the preferences and quantify them so that we can understand how big of a deal is it to have feature X versus Y versus Z. Um, so you have to keep in mind that the goal of a conjoint analysis is to build a generalized model. Once we get into simulators, that's where we can be specific. So conjoint builds the generalized model. Market simulators are where we can say, hey, my brand never makes blue widgets, so I'm never gonna simulate a blue widget option. But that doesn't mean you don't want to understand how people's preferences relate to each other based on different colors and different brands. So you, you've almost got this, um, the idea of statistical efficiency, right? We want to make sure that everything is nice and balanced and varying evenly. And that's your best, uh, your best bet at coming up with a model that helps you understand what people's preferences are without messy correlations and um, confounding effects and things like that. Okay, <clears throat> and then kind of the last little bit on design is generally speaking, you wanna keep things simple. Um, there's, a, there's a tendency to try to be as realistic as possible and, and make things really complicated. And there's a definite place for that. Um, conjoint, we often describe conjoint as a pretty deep rabbit hole where you can um, start to learn about tips and tricks and how to handle more complicated situations and things like that. But it's a good idea to try to keep things as simple as possible. That helps you interpret the model and explain it to clients and, and things like that. So general rule to keep things simple. Also remember that you want your attributes and levels to be mutually exclusive. Um, there are some situations where, um, you know, some markets where price is an indicator of quality. Um, or if you're maybe potentially measuring the same thing multiple times, like uh, a, a product life expectancy and a warranty, where you might, it might be really weird to respond for respondents to see something with a, a really long warranty and a low product life expectancy. Or when people try to add things like quality, good quality versus bad quality. Um, some of those things don't necessarily combine together. So make sure to think about uh, the full profiles you're gonna be showing people to make sure that all of your attributes and levels can combine um, without kind of making confusing options for people. And then the last one is there's also a natural tendency to try to say, well, I really wanna understand price, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut my price uh, attribute into lots of small little you know, 50 cent or dollar increments or something like that. 
And um, generally speaking, it's probably better to use larger equidistance uh, price levels and get more observations on a set of common things rather than spreading out your data points across you know, a 20 level attribute where you increment the price in $100 um, levels or something like that. So generally speaking, again, this, this all goes together with keeping it simple and, and not going overboard with things. So the next section is about testing pitfalls. Um, I have to admit, it's, uh, it's really sad when someone goes into the field and it's kind of clear that they didn't really test their survey. Uh, sometimes we'll see things like a blank level or we'll see the same level repeated twice. Um, those type of things are, are a lot easier to find if you're actually running through your survey or have someone else doing it and testing, actually going through the flow, both from data collection into analysis um, with sample data before going into the field. We also see a lot of surveys that are just really hard for people to do. Um, I once saw a survey that was about manager attributes and it had like 15 attributes and you could tell the person was just trying to shove in every possible thing that got put on the whiteboard during a meeting or something like that. And the survey was just untakeable. I don't know how anyone completed the survey. There was way too much information on the screen. Um, the, the descriptions of the levels weren't clear. Uh, and uh, it was clearly a survey that didn't get any outside feedback before going out to respondents. So make sure that you test your survey. Make sure that someone else tests your survey. Uh, grab a spouse. I, I make my wife take surveys sometimes just to make sure nothing weird is going on. Um, we have other people in the office take a survey and, and help out with quality assurance. Um, there's also a really uh, interesting uh, feature in uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of people that don't even know that this is a thing. Uh, Mechanical Turk is a platform for um, setting up what are called human intelligence tests. And it's kind of like artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, it's a pretty popular platform for uh, particularly academic surveys uh, because you can get people to take surveys for pretty cheap. So it's potentially a pretty decent idea. Um, and we've got an article on our website. You know, you can write us in if you want to learn more about that, about how to use Mechanical Turk. Um, but it's a pretty cost effective way of doing some quality assurance and getting real respondents to go through your survey if you've got something that's um, pretty important. And then I already mentioned the next bullet point. Make sure that you run through analysis as well. It's not enough just to test the survey and click through the buttons, um, but you want to actually step through your analysis, make sure you're not getting any warnings, make sure that you, know, you don't have the same level twice coming in your output, um, make sure that you can run the type of simulations that you want to run with the data that you've collected. Um, so go start to finish. Test the survey with real people, and then step through the analysis to make sure all your ducks are in a row. And there's not going to be any surprises when you're done. Um, the next section is <clears throat> analysis pitfalls. So this is after data collection. We're getting ready to come in and uh, build our models. Um, one of the things that trips people up all the time is uh, just looking at averages without diving a little deeper into things. So um, you know, this isn't related just to conjoint, but in any type of analysis, we know that averages can be misleading if you don't have a nice normal distribution in there. So my favorite example, if I was trying to wow some students, I would say, did you know that the average starting salary for a law, a law school graduate is $98,000? And that sounds like a pretty impressive number. But unfortunately, it's a pretty misleading number. Um, if you actually look at the data, there's very few people who make uh, either somewhere around the, the mean or um, the re they actually report an adjusted mean to try to pull it down a little bit. But you can see from the distributions that almost nobody is making that amount. A lot of people are making significantly less and you've got this tail end distribution and this spike over on the right side that pulls that mean really high up. 
So averages can be misleading for sure. From a conjoint perspective, <clears throat> we'll use a really simple example here. Let's assume a situation where we happen to have uh, polar opposites in our population. And there's, just to keep things simple, we'll say there's a really strong segment of people. They, they have very uh, positive feelings about Coke negative feelings about Pepsi and Sprite's kind of hanging out in the middle there. And then the other half of the, the population is the reverse. Really strong positive feelings for Pepsi, really strong negative feelings for Coke, and again Sprite is hanging out in the middle. So if you ended up surveying say 50 people from each group and we just calculated average utilities, we're going to get a pretty misleading story where we say, well, on average, Sprite's most preferred, but there's not really anything going on in these utilities. The, the brand of the soda really isn't that important. And you'd be completely wrong. It's completely misleading to make that case. Now, hopefully you would do things like, you would notice there's enormous standard deviations or standard errors uh, on your averages. Hopefully you'd be looking at distributions and noticing that it's a, large bimodal distribution. Hopefully you'd run some simulations and understand that in actuality, nobody chooses Sprite when I run simulations. So you can't simply trust average utilities um, when they come out of your models. You, you really need to be digging a little deeper to make sure that you're getting the whole picture on things. Okay, the next one is uh, a little bit of a story time, and it's this idea that you can't just look at the output of your models without thinking about how decisions you made upstream during the design flow into the analysis. And so uh, <clears throat> this is a picture. This is my brother and I. Uh, we are pretty close. Uh, you might say that we have similar preference structures, but we kind of diverged in our lives a little bit. I went into business and kind of statistics and, and do marketing research things. Um, and he went into dentistry, a uh, completely different path, started in food science, figured out he liked teeth, which is kind of weird, and uh, decided to go to school for seven more years afterwards and get into orthodontics. So it's a pretty lucrative field. Um, and the last time I went to visit him, he went and showed me uh, his latest toy, which is a Tesla Model X. Um, we drove around in it. My kids lovingly refer to it as the rocket ship. And uh, it can do zero to 60 in like four or five seconds, something like that. So it's a pretty impressive vehicle. Um, now, my brother and I are very similar. We both think that that is a pretty cool car. Um, so if we're starting off at that point, Brian likes Tesla, my brother Mike likes Tesla. We probably have pretty similar preference structures on the brands of the cars that we're dealing with. But if you put us both through a conjoint design that reflects realistic pricing for Teslas, sadly to say, I am not gonna be purchasing a Tesla Model X anytime soon. However, my brother has a higher willingness to pay uh, than I do. And so he would choose the Tesla a lot in the survey while I would probably choose something else uh, as my choice when I'm running through the survey. So you've got all these choices where Brian does not choose Tesla, Mike does choose Tesla. So how is the software gonna model our preferences for Tesla? Well, you're gonna be able to build a pretty good model that fits my choices by giving Tesla a negative utility value. Um, and that's not <clears throat> wrong per se, because we don't really have a lot of outside information. Um, so that, that would be probably a, a typical way for the, the model to end up, that I like other brands better, my importance on price is a lot larger than my brother's, and so you're, you're building a good model for the world you've put us in, where Teslas are, ex are more expensive than other vehicles. Um, so you build a, a correct model, but again, if you're just looking at the averages, you, you might not necessarily have the whole picture because you've you've set me up in a situation where I can't choose Tesla very often. So that's an example of a design decision showing realistic pricing where Teslas are more expensive. That's kind of that correlation thing I mentioned earlier 
um, we're kind of getting a confounding effect between brand and price in here that's not necessarily giving us a generalized model. It's accurate to predict what I would do, but um, doesn't necessarily reflect uh, my utility independent of other things. A similar example might be <clears throat> same situation. Brian likes Tesla. My brother Mike likes Tesla. And so we decide to put in some prohibitions into our pricing. So we'll say Toyota's show at the low price points, Tesla's show at the high price points. In this case, I'm gonna have kind of the same behavior. I'm gonna choose the Toyotas. My brother's gonna choose the Teslas. And so if without any other effort, how would the software model our preferences on price? Well, again, we'd probably have a bit of a confounding effect on here that would say, hey, Mike likes higher prices. He chose levels three, four, and five a lot more than he chose levels one, two, and three. And so you might end up with a reversal on the preference. Um, and again, there's ways to deal with this. We're not necessarily going into all those, but there are ways to handle realistic pricing and products that cover completely different price bands and things like that. Um, but if we just dove in with what this is, this is, tends to be what people do in their first projects is just say, oh, I'll just put in some prohibitions in here. And so you can end up with some kind of mistakes when you're building your model um, and you're not, you're not quite getting the full picture of what's really going on. So you really have to remember the decisions you make upstream <clears throat> on your design are going to flow through into your analysis and into your model. Okay. The next section we're going to talk about is on market simulators. <clears throat> uh, market simulators are awesome. We love running simulations. Uh, we often joke uh, with other people that if we could just uh, collectively wipe the knowledge of utility scores and attribute importances from clients' minds and memories, that uh, the world would probably be a better place and we could just put simulators into people's hands. Um, so we love simulators. They they turn um, these kind of difficult to wrap your brain around utility scores, there's positives and negatives, there's they're interval scaled and the zero doesn't really have a concrete meaning and there's a lot of baggage that comes along with utilities and attribute importances. So we really like market simulators because they turn those numbers into share predictions. Nobody can misunderstand 80% of the people choose configuration one and 20% of the people choose configuration two. It's a pretty clear message um, for anyone regardless of your background. So simulators are great. Um, they, they definitely better reflect real world, real world behavior. Um, a lot of times people will want to try to calculate like a, a, a single number that represents the willingness to pay for some feature. And yeah, mathematically, there's ways to do that, but we don't really favor that approach because it's, it's kind of missing the whole idea of, of a competition, of a competitive scenario. And so, for example, we have a technical paper that talks about um, assessing willingness to pay uh, through simulations rather than trying to equate like a dollar value to every utility point. Um, so we really like simulations for that reason. They put things into a competitive um, scenario uh, and, then, and then people are predicted to choose based on the utility models um, that we built for them. So it's kind of like your own little choice laboratory. It's a what if simulator um, and the results come out expressed to terms that make sense to management or anyone who's not in the marketing research department or doesn't have maybe the right background uh, to get into regression and betas and utility scores and things like that. So your simulator really is where you answer those questions. Remember we talked about thinking about simulations at the beginning and trying to put uh, those insights into questions that you can answer. So for example, you can answer questions like at what price do people start switching to my competitor? Or if I introduce a new product, is it gonna cannibalize my existing products or is my total share gonna grow? Are people more interested in a high-end expensive product or a low performance but low cost option? 
Um, we've also seen conjoints used for tracking studies to try to say, hey, how are things like price sensitivity or brand loyalty, how do those things kind of vary year to year? Um, it also does let you test um, you know, the willingness to pay for different features. Should we put the time and effort into developing feature X, does it actually move the needle in a competitive environment where maybe there's some good alternatives already? Now, conjoint simulators aren't a crystal ball. <clears throat> That's another kind of uh, pitfall that people can, uh, can run into as they think we've somehow managed to perfectly capture everyone's preferences and we've got this magic crystal ball here. And so we gotta, we gotta take a step back a little bit and understand that there are quite a lot of assumptions that go into our simulations. Um, one assumption is that we've interviewed the right people. Um, if you're trying to understand what uh, add-ons to Teslas, you probably don't wanna be interviewing me since I'm not the target market for that. Um, we're also usually uh, thinking that each person is in the market to buy. Um, not always the case. Sometimes we'll use none choices and uh, things like that to gauge interest. Um, we're, think, we're assuming that people have answered reliably and truthfully. Not always the case. Um, there are some built-in fit statistics that can help us understand how consistent respondents are um, that are really helpful to use. And we're kind of assuming, we don't really say it, but we're kind of assuming that all attributes that affect buyer choice in the real world have been accounted for. When we put someone through a conjoint and we, we put seven attributes in front of them, we're kind of saying, I can get a pretty reasonable expectation of what you're gonna choose based on these attributes that I've chosen. But we of course know that there's lots of other things that go into the choice that someone makes uh, when they're walking down a grocery store aisle, and we have not captured that. We sure hope that preference is the main driving force for what people do, but advertising exists. We know that we, or at least we make the assumption that people can be influenced and uh, we can nudge people in different directions and things like that. So preference uh, is not the only thing that goes into real world markets and choices and purchases and things like that. We also kind of have some mathematical assumptions. Um, when we run simulations, we assume that there's equal availability, that we're essentially putting these options in front of a person on a silver platter and all they have to do is kind of point their finger and say, I like that one the best. And that's not really what happens in the real world. We're also assuming that there are, uh, is equal uh, awareness of products. We know that that isn't always the case. We're assuming a long range equilibrium, equal effectiveness of sales force, um, no out of stock conditions. So again, we're not necessarily accounting for a lot of these things. We're making some assumptions. So market simulators, not crystal balls, but still really useful, way better than asking people to do some rating scales on some different products and things like that. We are definitely asking questions in a more useful way. We're building more robust models that quantify the trade-offs, but you have to recognize the weaknesses. Your, your simulator probably is not going to perfectly predict the real world uh, when all is said and done. However, there are some ways that we can shore up those weaknesses. Um, so we're going to spend just a couple minutes. We're not going to dive too deep into these, but more so that you know that they're a thing that you can do. So that other stuff, awareness, availability, uh, we call those external effects. And so it's a, uh, the way that I think of them the most is, I love my kids, but man, I do not like taking them grocery shopping because they just want everything and then they have to go to the bathroom and I have to leave my cart and go. And uh, it's, a, it's not quite as good of an experience uh, with little kids. So there's other stuff that goes into my purchase decision when I'm pushing my cart down the grocery store. Um, I might deviate from my uh, utility maximizing economics rational model and uh, maybe start choosing some things that, that aren't uh, optimal for me. So we're just gonna talk about some of the, the easier external effects that uh, particularly if you're using Sawtooth software, uh, we make it relatively easy to do some of these things. 
So the first one is uh, adjusting for distribution. We know that uh, in most markets, there's not equal distribution. If you walk into one store, you might see some different options on the shelf for the same product category than if you walk into another store. So there are some ways that you can do this in a pretty defensible way. So a good way would be just to think about, hey, I understand that there's this different product availability. And so we can tweak our simulators and uh, rather than think of it as like a one-off simulation, here's the products on the silver platter, which one do you point at? Which one do I predict you would choose? And we can think, well, let's send people on shopping trips. They'll go into the market over and over and over again, and they see different products on the shelf. So product A might always be available every time they, they go in to make their purchases, but product B might only be on the shelf 50% of the time. And so that's a pretty defensible assumption to make um, to kind of shore up our simulations and bring in some external data to go beyond just a preference model of what people are interested in. A bit better way to do it might be to actually set up stores. So maybe we ask some additional questions in the survey about where people shop and, or how often they shop at places or whether or not they shop at a store at all. We could use that to now send people uh, into the market, but this time they have different probabilities of going into stores. And so if they walk into store A, they don't see maybe configuration X on the store shelf. But if they walk into store B, they see all possible configurations of a product on there. So we're using specific data from respondents to shore up our uh, distribution and our product availability assumptions. And so the best way to do that would probably be on an individual basis. So you can ask people individually, um, do you shop at store A, B, C, D? You can create different um, stores with different products on the shelf, and then again, send people on their shopping trips over and over again, and uh, kind of formalize this uh, availability effect into our conjoint predictions. <clears throat> Another thing that you might do is to adjust for awareness. <clears throat> again, like distribution, it requires some type of data, some external data from us, but it could be something as simple as asking people, maybe before or after a conjoint, which of these brands have you heard of, or which ones would you consider buying? And then when you get into the simulator, on an individual basis, you can use that data to effectively turn off products. So if I'm going through a survey and I told you I've never heard of brand C, then you can create a simulation scenario like usual, but you can turn off the product C options for me. So you're effectively reducing my consideration set um, based off of some other data that I've provided. So again, that's a very defensible way to um, adjust and go just beyond a, a preference model at predicting what people would choose. Another kind of fun one that a lot of people don't know that you can do in our software is called a top end simulation. And it's the same idea of kind of reducing someone's consideration set. Um, so in this example, uh, in, a, in a typical conjoint, again, setting them out on a silver platter, the person points at an option and that's the one they choose. Um, with a top end, we might say, I'm gonna make the assumption that people really are only choosing from their, say, top three uh, options. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna effectively remove, um, in this case, products four and five, uh, which have a much lower probability of being chosen, and just make a decision, make a, a prediction about people based on their top three products, for example. And again, <clears throat> that's a relatively defensible way to do things. People aren't probably really looking at a store shelf and checking every single possible option before making their decision. Sometimes they are, but maybe sometimes they aren't. And there's other adjustments as well. Um, uh, a lot of people will um, create Excel-based simulators so that they can uh, still come up with those predictions, but you can do other things like maybe a bass diffusion model to try to predict that market penetration or, or something like that. So there's lots of other approaches that probably deserve um, consideration as well. Okay, and then the last pitfall is not asking questions. So 
please ask questions. Um, Satu Software puts a high focus on educating people. Um, if you've ever interacted with our support team, we hope you've had a maybe a, a little bit better than average experience where we're willing to um, help you understand and not just maybe debug an issue or something like that. Um, but this doesn't just apply to um, technical support. Um, I will say that uh, in going to conferences and things like that, I feel like generally speaking, other SAW2 software users are probably are really, really helpful folks. Um, I've had lots of conversations with people much smarter than me who have taken the time uh, to explain concepts to me and, and help me understand uh, difficult things that maybe went over my head. Uh, so forum, we've got a users group on LinkedIn where you can uh, interact with us. We do conferences and workshops, um, all of these extra avenues. So don't go at it alone. If you need some help, ask questions. Um, we love talking about Conjoint. We're the type of people that will run our in-laws through Conjoint and MaxDiff surveys to figure out vacation spots and, and things like that. So please reach out to us. Even if you're not a customer, we still like talking to you about this sort of stuff. So that's the end of my slides here. Um, I'm gonna turn the time back over to Aaron. I see we've got uh, some questions popping up. And so we're gonna give you some opportunities to continue to ask questions. Um, so Aaron, I'm gonna turn the time back over to you now. Thanks, Brian. So yeah, so there's uh, several questions that have been asked uh, online. So I'm, I've been answering a couple of them here. Uh, Brian, uh, we have one question in the example with the Tesla, what was the primary reason that Toyota was chosen at the same price point as the Tesla? Is it simply because of brand preference? I would assume at this price point, the preference shifts to Tesla. Yeah, so that, I mean, I just kind of threw some numbers out there. Um, so uh, again, it, it kind of depends. The, the idea there is uh, if you have too many prohibitions, either the design will kind of explode and not be able to be created at the beginning, or if you have too many prohibitions, the regression simply explodes and, and it doesn't work. You can't come up with a model. Um, so if you have some overlap like that, um, that was more of a making sure that it would actually work kind of a thing. I'm not necessarily saying uh, that you would do that. Um, so just a simple example, don't read into the numbers too much. It was more of just to illustrate the fact that um, if you start putting in prohibitions and correlating attributes, you might end up, uh, you, you just have to recognize that that's probably going to flow through into your analysis. That was the main point we were just trying to drive home there. Okay. All right. Are there guidelines on what cases price prohibitions are good? Um, yeah, so you know there there is a case for prohibitions. Generally speaking, you're you're kind of making the trade-off between uh, realism and statistical efficiency. So if you know I'm doing a cell phone survey, I might decide it's not worth it for me to ever show an iPhone at maybe my low two price points. Um, I know that <clears throat> it's just unrealistic. It might confuse people and make them think that something is wrong with that iPhone or something like that. And so we say, hey, I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of design efficiency to make my pricing a little more realistic. And then I'm just going to remember that that's the case. And I'll probably do something like go into my settings when I'm building my model and I'm going to apply a constraint. I'm going to force uh, the low prices to be preferred over the high prices. And I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna nudge the model in the right direction, um, even though uh, I've got some correlation and people never saw iPhones at the cheapest price or something like that. So they're definitely, we're, you know, we, the general rule is avoid prohibition. That's the safe approach. That's, that's what we're gonna tell any new person, try to avoid prohibitions. Um, but they're not inherently evil. They're like anything else. They can be a tool. They can be misused. They can kind of torpedo your whole design. Uh, they can get you into trouble. Um, but if, if they make the survey a lot more realistic for people, then 
then you can you can use them for sure. That's why they're in the software. That's why they're a thing. Um, you just want to use responsibly. Great, thanks. I think we probably have time for uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, what about sample size? Is there any validated solution for how to determine sample size, Brian? Uh, yeah, so it depends a bit. Um, methodology to methodology. Some of our, uh, the rating scale approaches um, can work with really small sample sizes. Um, with the choice-based approaches, you generally have a larger concern with sample size. You're probably, you know, if we're throwing out rules of thumb, you're probably thinking of like two to 300 respondents um, is where you're starting at. If your attributes and levels are, uh, you have a really big list of attributes and levels, it's probably going to go up. If you're just testing a couple attributes and levels, you might be able to shrink it down a little bit. Um, particularly with choice-based conjoint, um, we have some design testing in the software where you can actually simulate respondents answering the data. It tells you, uh, make sure that your design is nice and balanced, and then also gives you some estimated standard errors. So a lot of that stuff is built into the software or in the documentation. Um, but it's hard to kind of give a, a specific rule because methodologies differ and designs differ and uh, and things like that. So that's one of those things where if you ever have a question, it's a really nice thing to just shoot an email to us or send us a call and um, we'd be happy to take a look at your survey and give you any pointers for things to make sure that you're in good shape. Great, thank you. All right, uh, last question uh, in the short of the weaknesses section, you uh, talked about calibration. Can you just briefly describe that process? Uh, let's see, I talked about calibration. Let me see here. Or just in, in general, can you? In general. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we talked mostly, the, the two that I kind of focused on that are the most defensible are, are the idea of adjusting for distribution and awareness. Um, these, these are things that are built into the software. Um, so you have to collect the data in your survey, um, but we make it relatively easy. It's not quite point and click, but we make it relatively easy to change these assumptions. Um, for example, you know, it takes you about 30 seconds to set up the market level distribution where you say, um, here's the different products and here's how often they're available on people's shopping trips. So most of the time it's a pretty point and click experience. Um, this is a topic where, uh, again, you know, we could probably spend an entire webinar talking about external effects. My goal here was just to kind of let you know that it's a thing and, and, and put it, uh, you know, plant a seed uh, so that you think about it next time. Um, there, I know there was another question about white papers and things like that. Oh yeah, we got white papers. So if you're wanting to learn more and dive deeper into external effects, we've got past webinars that talk about um, using the simulator and we'll walk you through how to do that. Uh, we've got white papers on distribution uh, and awareness effects and some other external things. So that's one of those things, ask questions. If you want, if any of these topics you wanna talk about in depth more, um, feel free to uh, email us in or set up a time to chat with us, give us a call. We love talking about this sort of stuff. So I know we can't answer all the questions, which is unfortunate, but reach out to us for sure and uh, we'll answer all the questions you have. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll try to put together something uh, where we answer some of these questions. So we'll, we'll send out something where we have the white papers and answer some of these other questions. There's some great questions in here that we'd love to, to answer if we had the time. Um, just a couple of notes in closing. The next webinar is uh, going to be February 27th when we'll have Keith Sean present on Applied Max Diff based on his and Brian's, Brian Orm's new book. Uh, so we'd love to have you attend that. You can find out more information on our website at satisoftware.com then click on training up at the top and then on webinars. Also know that we have a three day CBC workshop next week in Orlando. So if you need to escape the snow and uh, you can make it, uh, registration's still open. You can come join us in Orlando at Universal Studios and. Uh, listen to me drone on and on about conjoint so and then also finally if you have any questions about any of the stuff we've covered today like brian said uh please write in to support at sachi and one of our helpful tech support representatives or maybe even brian or myself 
will uh, hop on and answer those questions for you. So thank you very much for attending. We've loved having you here. Uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks so much.